Hey everybody, welcome back to Recordology. Okay, you know what I think we need in our life? Another record player. You're not gonna wanna miss this. Let me apologize up front if you hear or when you hear terrifying banshee sounds in the background. The place isn't haunted. We've just got some incredible wind noise today. Wind gusts are, are crazy here in the Denver metro area. But that's okay because I had one of the best thrift store days that I've had in a long time because we found some great stuff. Let's start with the records. I know you didn't click on this to see records, but we're gonna show them to you anyway. For some reason, this particular store was loaded with female mid 50s and 60s pop vocalist. So we've got Movin' by K Star, this Sugar and Spice album by Peggy Lee, which is sort of a double sided cover, Patty Page, another uh, live Peggy Lee album, Rosemary Clooney, Doris Day, and even a little bit of Broadway slash uh, movie audio, movie soundtrack, The Pajama Game. Then I came across this. And this is awesome. It's just a mechanical switch. As you guys may know, I've been using my Pelican mechanical switch, which is limited to four inputs. So I got to get creative with all the goodies I've got set up there in my office. This is going to give me one more output. And again, there's no power because it's mechanical. It's just, it's literally just mechanically connecting the inputs to the outputs. So using this in tandem with my other switch will give me all of the inputs that I will need. And it looks cool too. I wish this had enough inputs, I could just use it by itself, but $3.99 for that is not bad. Plus they were charging a dollar or a dollar 99 for records. So the prices were just great. On a downside, you may have noticed some stickers on those records. They have the most indestructible stickers that were really hard to get off. I spent the last 45 minutes trying to peel them off. And if they're on paper, they just start to tear. And I just, you know, it's really, really annoying. But I didn't go there for records. I didn't go there for a switch. I went there because I've been looking for a record player for us to review. And this particular store, which I don't go to very often, has not disappointed in the past. We've got some goodies there. And today was no different because I found this. This is an RCA lab 1200 fully automatic turntable and as the thumbs start going so fast in typing comments out right now in a blur it's just a rebranded lp60 it is the similar mechanism that we have seen predating the audio technica lp60 if you want to get technical going back into the 90s with the iowa units continuing to this day with an lp60x and others including the crosley t400 this is that familiar mechanism, but they're variances. So how does this unit perform? Now, the first question that my geeky self wants to know is when was this produced? And that's a little tricky and I'll get into that in a minute, but let's take a look. So I paid 15 bucks for this. So price is right. I'm going to take a, a gamble at 15 bucks on a fully automatic turntable. Uh, it is pretty scratched up there. That's annoying. There's another sticker that I, you know, I literally couldn't peel that off. So I may need some goo gone. And then this is the remnants of another sticker, which is pretty sticky still, as you can tell. And it's got the familiar controls on the front panel. Let's look at that. Okay, so front left, we've got the speed selector switch. It's a two position switch. This is obviously a two speed turntable. While we're down here, let's look at that foot. It's just a plastic cup with an inner rubber foot. You know, this just kind of gives it the look from a distance of a substantial large higher end audio device foot that is just cheap plastic by the way there is the branding i love the 70s rca logo that's cool to see this is an interesting turntable because it's actually three corporations are involved i'll show you that in a minute and then our familiar play stop and cue so play will start it stop will return it and cue will raise and lower the tone arm let's look at the back so trying to discern a date from the serial number, if VO Westlife is watching this video, he will already have this thing dated. March of 12, but no, because Tandy Corporation, I believe was long gone by then. They were sort of, you know, killed off in 2000. Um, you know, maybe this is 
the year 2000, February 30, no, it couldn't be February 31st. Uh, let's see. Um, the year 2000, December 3rd. Let's go with that. That makes sense. Um, the RCA cables are permanently attached. The power cord, 12A03. At one point, I was thinking December of 2003. You guys are going to have to help me there. But uh, there it is. RCA, fully automatic turntable. And here are the three corporations. We've got Tandy, which at that point was, you know, the parent company of Radio Shack. And RCA was a brand that they were using kind of heavily around the post-1999 era. There's no covers on the back of these. I wonder if there used to be covers. Both sides just have bare metal spring-loaded clips. It's pretty basic. Looking on the bottom, this does have four feet. The two up front with the sort of showpiece plastic shell and then the two business ones in the back. It looks like these punch outs do exist. So this would be, you know, adjustments to allow you to change where it drops at the beginning of the record. If you wanted to fine tune that, change where it returns, et cetera, et cetera. There's little black stickers covering those positions up. And then the speed adjustments over here, there's two pots and actually there's three holes, two say 45, one says 33. So it's probably a shared mold. And then the sticker for this 45 one has been removed so apparently somebody has adjusted the speed on this or we're just curious what was under there besides that we've got the typical don't open it up and shock yourself and some screw holes and yeah that's pretty much it it's it's a fairly basic device we've seen this a lot before but it's a great unit and you know for people that say perhaps rightfully so that you shouldn't buy a modern retro turntable you should go and buy used you can find you know decent prices on retro or vintage at that point vintage turntables at your local thrift store charity store secondhand shop whatever they call it in your area and this is an example perhaps we'll see how it performs 15 bucks is not bad all right let's flip it over again incidentally it's interesting this comes with an rca cable with a grounding wire which indicates typically that you can deactivate the built-in preamp because when using an external preamp, you need that grounding wire. When you're using the built-in preamp, you don't. You just need the RCA leads. The problem is I don't see a switch. So maybe this has a, a weirdly positioned switch. Next point of notice is that, or point of interest, is that the cord is nice and long, like a five, six foot cord. It's amazing. So anytime you get anything used, whether it be Craigslist, you know, Facebook Marketplace, whatever, Mercari, and certainly at your local thrift stores, secondhand stores, or people on the East Coast apparently have dumps that they go to, <laughs> which I've got a friend, he buys stuff or gets stuff from dumps. And, it, and when I think of a dump, I'm thinking of a landfill because that's what we would you know, consider a dump. But he'll be like, yeah, I got this uh, Glenn Miller record set at the dump. I'm like, what are you talking about? At the landfill? Are you marching? No, it's like a secondhand thing. But anyway, anytime you get some grimy old thing, get yourself some disinfectant wipes. I mean, this is mandatory, you guys. You need this. So let me just give an example here. See all that gunk? That's just off of the cords. That's just the cords. So it, it'll really shine up, you know, whatever you've invested in. And things just collect dust. And a lot of people, especially if they're about to donate it, don't care about it anymore. And they'll just allow it to collect that dust. And plus, not only does this get the dust off, but it disinfects it, makes it clean. And in this day and age, clean ain't bad, right? So let's go ahead and lift the lid. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, we're dusty under here. Before <laughs> This is great. I love the tone arm underneath pinched down by the mat. I'm not going to look at that yet. We're going to take a look at that, but I have to clean this at least a cursory level clean. Perhaps I'm obsessive in this regard, but I just want it clean. Dang it. It's gonna take some more cleaning besides this, but let's just give it a, a quick wipe down, shall we? Yes, all right. All right, it definitely needs more, but that's gonna to have to do for now. All right, so, and as it dries, you will see, you know, it look wet and then kind of, see how dirty that is? Needs more cleaning, but that is definitely a good start. That's mandatory. You will definitely want to do that, especially things that are switches and whatnot that are touched. 
by their previous owner. Okay, let's scoot in here and see what we got. I do like the nice thin profile of this. It's, it's small, yet it's a full-size platter. That is a full-size platter. Let's start with the platter. The number one mistake that anybody with this unit makes is by putting a plastic platter on and not a metal one. Case in point, the Crosley 400, T400, which is another variant of this basic automatic design. No, it is not made by Audio, Audio Technica. It's actually made by the same company that makes the Audio Technica units. We're not going down that road. That's a separate topic. But anyway, they chose to go with the plastic platter. I'm like, what? So does this have a plastic platter? First of all, the mat is a rubber mat. Take that off. And plastic. Dang it. Why, 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 why? It's lightweight, it's cheaper to ship. It physically works. But like we've talked about before, mass inertia, right? A heavy platter is important because it fights against the variations and fluctuations in motor speed. Did I bring my, oh yeah, so by the way, it's probably powered off of one of these guys, little JYK motor. This motor powers everything from Crosley type suitcase players, there, I'm part of the problem. Suitcase players, automatic LP3s, LP60s, LP120s, you know, probably this very unit. Two, they're usually two-speed motors, but they can be uh, wired to actually perform at three speeds with a brass pulley. I'm sure that that's what's powering this. It is pretty much the motor of all entry level and kind of mid-range turntables. But yeah, they went ahead and put a plastic platter on this thing. So with this not weighing as much and not having that inertia, it means that it'll be more susceptible to wow and flutter because the weight and the movement of it, the inertia of it won't absorb those variations that the motor is going to be giving off because all motors are going to be, you know, having little stair step motions, cogging is a word for it. So that's, that's a bummer. So let's take a look under the hood a little bit. We're going to, these little things here allow you to uh, release the belt from around the motor. That's a real brittle and real stretched out belt. I can already tell. Um, but the reason why there's two is just so it distributes the weight evenly. But yeah, they went for the cheapo, cheapo. Oh, there's a sear clip on it too. That's interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna have to get my little flathead screwdriver out and take that little clip off. Sir clip, C clip, E clip. It's this little thing right here. Typically you see this on a, a suitcase player, an all-in-one unit, something where it doesn't want the platter to fall out. This holds the platter down in place and then goes shooting. Save that. They're harder to put on than they are to take off. But now we can take the platter off, no worries whatsoever. All right. Now all we got to do is lift. Lift. Good Lord. Okay, there we go. Uh, now let's look at the bottom of the platter. It's just, I mean, it's litter. This thing weighs nothing. It's like super light, light flimsy plastic. I think I read somewhere that somebody upgraded their uh, platter to a metal one off of an old broken LP60. But there it is, guys, the very common mechanism that powers these. Interesting place for a phono switch. Look at this. There's the, there it is. That is the preamp switch. How funny. I have never seen one in that position that I can recall. Oh, that is weird. How funny. Huh. Why not, right? I guess this is something you're not going to be switching every day. So they figured, well, I'll hide it under here. Line output. So yeah, line output would be the line mode. That's the on for the preamp or phono level would be off for the preamp. We're going to leave it on. And, you know, like I said, everything else here is, is, you know, par for the course and it looks clean. It looks unused actually, but there's no grease on this thing. This is the cam wheel. This is what positions everything and kind of coordinates where that tone arm is and when it does what it does. Yeah, and there is the top of the motor. That, let's see here. We know what the top of this looks like. See those little stamped indents? Look at the, look at the, the brass pulley is a little different, but look at the shaft and where it connects down there. Now, compare that to this. See what I mean? It's kind of hard to tell actually, but it's probably a JYK or similar. There are a couple others, but yeah. Now, immediately, 
this belt is exhibiting issues because when I felt it to take it off, I felt it just felt very um, brittle. It does have a little bit of stretch. Maybe it's okay. It also has kinks where it's been sitting in position too. You'll see like, like right there, there's a little bit of a kink. So we may be able to get away with that. I'm not 100% sure. There's another don't look at me kind of piece of tape covering a voltage switch. And that's what, you know, pretty much what it comes down to. I'm going to put a little bit of oil on this thing to lubricate it a little bit, but you know, there's not much to see here, folks. Perhaps in a future episode, we will do a, a complete tear down and look at the underside, but it's pretty thin. I mean, the, the distance between these wells right here and the, and the bottom of the device is not much, maybe, you know, three quarters of an inch. So yeah, anyway. So I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can get that belt back on there and we'll look at the tone arm assembly. So the belt seemed actually to have enough pliability that it worked. So we'll, you know, we'll give it a shot, but that belt will need to be upgraded eventually. And true to form, I've lost the C-clip, E-clip, Sir clip already, which I do always, and it usually is right here on this countertop, blended in perfectly. All right, let's pl plug it in. It'll likely cycle through something and probably drop the needle on the rubber mat, but that's okay, we're gonna replace it anyway. So it starts right up. Always these are in, in the middle of some cycle when you first get them. So you kinda just gotta let them do their thing. And it's gonna try and drop, we're gonna save it from itself. And we're back kind of in a reset position. So with these, it's pretty simple. I mean, you got a, a switch right here to tell you you know, what size a record, a 12 inch or a six inch record, six inch. That's funny. It should be seven inch. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, that's really funny. And the speed selector switch, the out position is 33 RPM inset is for 45. And then the play or start button, stop or reject button, and then a Q button. The Q is just a, is a lift. So instead of having the little lift back here, the little lever, the cueing lever, it's up here on a button, which is cool. And it's actually got a decent amount of damping in there still. That fluid in the damping piston will dry out. Let's take a look at things up close here. So if I cue it up, you can see it lifts mechanically that cueing lever. The way it works is there is actually usually a metal rod connected from all three of these switches to the actual button in the back here on a circuit board or in the case of the lift, just a mechanical lift. And speaking of counterbalances and things, this is going to be probably a spring-loaded one. It could possibly be weighted with a little piece of metal back there. Never seen one of these, you know, track too heavy, though we'll test that. And it's pretty simple, straight metal tone arm. And for a cartridge, you're gonna get the Audio-Technica 3600L with, in this case, an unbranded cartridge on the front. But you know what? Just remove that, because who knows? Oh, nice. <laughs> Cantilever is missing. Okay, this one is definitely, that's probably why they donated it. They're probably, eh, doesn't work. Luckily, we've got an on-brand replacement. So we will simply, look how easy this is, guys. Okay, that's it. That's literally how quick and easy it is to replace your stylus on one of these. So an Audio-Technica 3600, it is statically mounted, so you won't be able to upgrade the cartridge. You couldn't put a different cartridge. If you wanna do that, you really gotta get into the LP3 territory, which gives you that full automatic, but gives you the ability to have that replaceable cartridge on a standard half inch mount. The LP60s, T400s, and things like this have a permanently affixed 3600 cartridge. So while you can change and upgrade the stylus like we just did, the cartridge is fixed. The cartridge is permanent. So let's go ahead and take a couple of measurements. Let's see what it tracks at to begin with. Okay, the Audio-Technica 3600 should track between three and a half grams to 4.2, 4.3-ish. Let's see where we're at with this guy, 3.36. Eh, 3 so yeah, I am comfortable with that number. Don't know if I mentioned this already, but I did take the dust cover off just for ease of filming, et cetera, et cetera. Man, I wish this was not a plastic platter. All right, taking the dust or the uh, platter mat off and replacing it with the stroboscopic platter that we use when we verify the speed. Now, 
we do not have to use the automatic functionality to operate this turntable. I'm gonna plug it back in, by the way. It works perfectly fully manual as well. The only thing that it will not do manually is auto stop at the end or just keep spinning at the end. It will auto return unless you deactivate that part, which I wouldn't recommend doing. So I'm going to be able to cue this up to start and stop things without using the automatic functionality. So I just raised it with the cueing lever. And then when I go over there, it's going to go to town. Wow, that was sluggish. That belt, you know, is probably just a bit, just a bit on the weak side. It's probably glazed. It's probably hardened a bit. All right, let's take a closer look here and see how this thing is performing speed-wise. Okay, so we are going to be looking at this inner set of rings here because we are in 60 hertz power. And more specifically, we're going to be looking at this band right here for 33 RPM and then in a minute here for 45. So we start here looking at the 33 RPM. We can see that those lines are marching to the left. That does not mean slow. That actually means a bit fast. And that's kind of on the high end for what I would like to see. When you drop the stylus down and add the drag that the stylus in, you know, introduces, it will slow down a little bit, but I'm gonna venture to say this is still running a tad bit fast. Off camera here, I'm switching to 45 RPM, so we will now be looking at this row, and true to form, it's a little fast as well. Typically, if one's fast, the other is fast, but again, it may not be audibly so. You know, it perhaps would be hard to tell. You can get in there uh, on the bottom side. It's very convenient. They put it on the bottom and <laughs> make those adjustments. Make sure that you use a jeweler's screwdriver, not just a small electronic screwdriver. You need an actual like eyeglass kit screwdriver because the ones that are any larger than that will short out on the casing of the motor and it'll be nearly impossible for you to set that speed. That is a lesson that I learned the hard way at least once. So, all right, the speed is close to accurate, good enough for our needs. There's only one thing left to do, guys, and that's to listen to this thing. So we are clearly not in the front room anymore. We are up in my office. And as such, you will notice and maybe smile at the fact that I have this record player on top of my LP3, which is currently my daily driver. Why is that funny? Because I'm always complaining about the fact that these scratch so easily. Well, maybe if I didn't stack record players on top of them, you guys, it's okay. I'm taking one for the team. So let's give this thing a listen. I will be listening on my Personas Eris 4.5s in the room. However, you will be listening to a direct feed. In fact, a high resolution direct feed. So put your headphones on if you want to. If not, that's okay. And let's test out the functionality, the start, the stop, the cueing of this and give it a pretty good listen. We're listening for resolution, we're listening for motor rumble, we're listening for just overall enjoyable sound. This is gonna be a basic conical or spherical stylus, so it's not gonna be giving us like the full potential of a record, but it should still sound full, rich, warm, all those things we love about vinyl. All right, hitting the play button, let's cue her up. I'm excited. I love this point. This is the magic moment. What's it going to sound like? Here we go. By the way, this is Enoch Light and the Light Brigade. Wow, it sounds great. It sounds fantastic. What do you guys think? I'm going to test out the automatic return, by the way. Give it another listen and we'll listen to it auto return. Oh. 
Okay, let's see if it brings it home. Hits the run out groove and it's perfectly positioned to do that. Does a great, great job. And then finally lowering it down into that rest. There it goes. Perfect. This thing works great. So now let's say we want to play another seven inch record, but this one, another Enoch light record, by the way, is the same size, seven inches, but it is now going to be the 33 RPM. So we make sure that we're on the right speed. This can stay where it's at and we're good to go. And it's very versatile. It allows you to play pretty much any kind of 33 or 45 record without any muss or fuss. But if you want to play 78s, you really can't do that. Okay, everybody, so what are my final thoughts on this record player? I think it's a great deal. For $15, we got a perfect condition record player, except for this needle. I happen to have one laying around. If you didn't, you can buy them for less than $10. If you wanted to pay more than you should, but have it instantly, you can now go to Walmart and buy for $25 the cartridge replacement stylus, I should say, the replacement stylus for the 3600 and have it working today. So this was a win-win all the way around. You don't, I don't, I noticed a little bit of wow and flutter. I don't know if you picked up on that. That's a speed inconsistencies. And again, uh, using a plastic platter was kind of like, come on guys, it's still wet under there. Um, having a metal platter probably would have resolved that. This is a nice heavy rubber mat, which helps a little bit, but still, it would have been better if they would have just gone for a legit aluminum or, or maybe even a steel platter would have even been better. So that being said, the stylus, lightweight platter, this is a great starter unit. This would be so good for somebody just getting into this. If they don't want to go the suitcase all-in-one vintage sort of novelty route, which I still maintain is fine, let them do it if that's what they want. But if you want to get into this for the sound quality, this, you can't beat this. You cannot beat this. Pretty much undisputed that this design, primarily in use with the LP60 and LP60X, which we've reviewed both of those, is the best unit for beginners if you're in this for the sound quality. And this is a good starting point. So what do you guys think? Let me know down in the comments below. So at the end of the day, that was a great buy. And it's testament to the fact that you can get a good setup for playing vinyl, getting started for less than 20 bucks. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So keep your eyes peeled, be patient. But if you live in a fairly sizable city like Denver and you're patient, you could you could spend a Saturday just drive across town, check out all the thrift stores. And I'd almost guarantee you by the end of it, you would find something. So hopefully this encourages folks. But thank you so much for watching. Consider subscribing if you haven't done so already. Would you do that? I would really appreciate it. Also, we've got all new merch. Check out the merch shelf down below. We've got TikTok. We've got the Vinyl Nation. All of those details are going to be in the description below. But that's it for now, my friends. Happy record hunting, and we will see you next time.